You are about to enter the Ghostly Archives. All right, everybody, good evening and welcome to the Ghostly Archives. I'm your host, Melissa Dawn, and I have a couple of great guests tonight. We are talking all about Bigfoot with Tobe Johnson and Brett Eichenberger. Here, we're going to explore the kind of mysterious world of Bigfoot, Sasquatch. Brett is the director of A Flash of Beauty, Bigfoot Revealed, and Tobe it features in the film and he does a lot of investigations and podcasts and all sorts of stuff on this topic so i'm not going to hold off much longer i'm going to bring the boys in welcome to the show hey melissa thanks for having us all right yeah i hear you guys have been pretty busy i don't know i think tobe froze up there but um i hear you've been pretty busy with all your projects brett what's going on in uh, sasquatch bigfoot land well, we were just, Tobe and Jill and myself were just down in Kelso, Washington, or up in Kelso, Washington, or depending on where you are geographically speaking, um, at Sasquatch Fest this weekend. And we were promoting both of our movies. So we have a Flash of Beauty, Bigfoot Revealed, and a Flash of Beauty, Paranormal Bigfoot. Two documentaries. Um, it's a series. One kind of dives us in, dives the audience into the flesh and blood realm, and the other one goes beyond that into the paranormal. And we explore some crazy paranormal Bigfoot sightings and experiences, and we kind of get into the science of it, too, to try and explain how some of these things are potentially happening. Um, and on top of that, it's we're running a YouTube page, A Flash of Beauty, on YouTube, and we're putting up interviews, and we're about to do some some new special videos. Not to mention working on some future documentaries as well. So it's been very busy. Wow! How, and Tobe, what's going on? What's new in your land with, in terms of research? And I know obviously you're attending stuff with Brett. Are you there, Tobe? Hello. Can you hear us? I don't think he can hear us. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I don't think he can hear us. He's just gonna sit there and look cool. Yeah, he's um the he's as mysterious as Bigfoot. <laughs> I'm gonna type him on the messenger. Okay, so while I sort this out with Tobe, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you what is your earliest memory of Bigfoot or Sasquatch and that got you into it? What how? How young were you when you became aware that this was a thing? That's a great question, Melissa. So I, I was, um, gosh, probably five or six years old. And my parents had this like weird book. I think it was called like Mysteries of the Unknown or something. And I was super into it. I just remember like kind of laying on my tummy as a little kid and folding it open on the floor and flipping the pages. And I'll never forget seeing that famous frame of Patty from the Patterson Gimlin film turned and looking towards the camera and wondering what is is that thing and kind of being captivated by it because I knew it lived in forests and um, of course you know as a little kid you're surrounded by forests in the Pacific Northwest and so kind of like everywhere we went I kind of wondered if that creature was in that forest so mm -hmm. that's how I got started. That's how what that's really what perked my interest. Interesting. So Tope's system froze up, so he's gonna come back in just so everyone knows. He made an exit, but we'll keep going. Um, I think you know, I'm gonna be really honest. I think my earliest memory was like Harry and the Hendersons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Probably yeah. a movie in the 80s when I was really little, but it's like um, so sometimes those are the things that kind of get you into it. And I had that. Do you remember the time life? book series mysteries of the unknown there was one about mysterious creatures and i think i probably mm -hmm. looked in there so it's it's fascinating how everyone comes across that can yeah. you hear us though i don't know what to say sorry guys it just we froze hear you. no 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 it's all good now Tobe, i'm gonna ask you um what's your earliest memory of bigfoot <laughs> oh, first of all what's going on in your life i know you're doing some things with brett but and then yeah. what's your earliest memory of bigfoot how you got into Gosh. this 
Well, let's see here. My earliest memory would have been circa probably experiencing it like everybody did watching the PG film when it scooted across one program and another. I'm probably going to blame, you know, Leonard Nimoy with In Search Of or something to that effect. But living in the or you know, in the Oregon area in the Pacific Northwest and seeing what looked like familiar country, I didn't know it was in California. I just assumed it was in tree country, right? Like the Pacific Northwest. So um, I just thought they were kind of everywhere. Um, it looked so real to me that I never really thought anything else. It's just like, well, I guess there's strange things out there. I want to see them one day. So that just followed me all the way. It still follows me. That you're right. and, and if you're and if you're already surrounded by that kind of nature, mm -hmm. it's sort of like as especially if you're a kid. Like I lived in in the prairies when I was a kid, but I didn't move over to the West Coast till I was teenagers later and I, you know, wasn't really interested in that anymore. But um, yeah, if you're surrounded by the woods and you hear stories that, have you guys, were you guys ever influenced by native myth or anything like that? Oh yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I remember, you know, just as like in grade school going and watching, there was this like kind of like native guy called Chief Laluska and he put on like, you'd go into like, his longhouse and they they do ceremonial dances and stuff like that and they talk about you know some of their culture and some of their legends and whatnot of course bigfoot factored into that and this was up near kind of near mount st helens in this little town called cougar wow. washington and um it was very lucky to be able to have that nearby to where we could go up there as kids you know on a field trip and see something like that and meet that you know representatives from that culture like chief laluska and, see those things so it's it's um and and just seeing the symbolism you know traveling around the pacific northwest you'd see you know bigfoot here bigfoot there bigfoot everywhere <laughs> so it was just <laughs> you couldn't get you couldn't get away from it with the exception of the real thing you know like we i never saw the real thing still haven't really sort of seen it yet it's like old mcdonald had a farm yeah <laughs> but it's bigfoot exactly a farm of big feet Right. Okay. So I was going to ask about common myths or misconceptions, but I think we'll get into that later. I think maybe perhaps we'll get into the film and what, how this film came about because it's been out for a while now, correct? Yeah. Yeah. It's been out for a little while. The sequel, um, a flash of beauty paranormal Bigfoot has just come out. Um, recently in, in wide release, I should say. It's been out technically speaking since Octo October, but it's uh, finally made it onto Amazon as of the end of December. So it's really kind of brand new. Um, but the, the genesis of this project started a long time ago. It started at least a decade ago, if not earlier, uh, when I met with my wife, Jill, who's also the writer and producer on the project. We immediately had this, um, this commonality with the paranormal and this fascination with the paranormal and she grew up on the northwest coast of oregon um where you know the legends of bigfoot are everywhere you know i mean you're about probably two to three degrees separation from someone who has had an experience i'd say and um so we had that in common and long story short in, in 2012 we had met some guys that were going to be you know potential investors in our film and they invited us to this exclusive invite only bigfoot conference and we didn't really know how lucky we were to be able to um, attend that. Um, they asked us and we you know, immediately said yes. And so we were able to go and meet really big folks in the Bigfoot world, you know, Peter Byrne and Ron Moorhead, Todd Neese. And um, I mean, we were just like fascinated just as bystanders, you know, we didn't mm -hmm. really know a lot about Bigfoot and we were able to ask you know, celebrities. And we knew who these people were just through our fascination. So so we were kind of like, uh, this is kind of crazy that we're like, here we are sitting across from Peter Byrne asking all these questions. I mean, it was amazing. And then, you know, um, then we got into our own film and video production and stuff like that. And, you know, we had teased to ourselves about doing a Bigfoot documentary. And so finally, the opportunity presented itself in um, in June of 2020. Uh, during the pandemic, everything was shut down. And we're like, you know what? We've got no business. Let's do this Bigfoot documentary. We have the time. We have the energy. We have the people. And so that's really where it started. And how, how did you and Tokmi 
Have you known each other for a long time or? We've known each other going back to past lives. Yeah, we've met on what? Tinder. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice a past wife. life on Tinder. <laughs> I, think, I think Tobe and I were probably guards at a medieval castle. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, something like that. Um, uh, the quick answer to that question is we actually met through Daryl Adams. <laughs> Um, but the funny thing is, is that Jill and I had seen Tobe in a documentary called The Alien Bigfoot Connection. And um, I was like, whoa, these guys are like down in Cottage Grove. We got to talk to them for our documentary. And um, we were at this this gathering in June of 2020. And here comes Daryl. And we're like, that's the guy. That's Daryl. You know, and so long story short, Daryl introduced us to Tobe. And we immediately knew he needed to be part of the team. And rest assist and we're just we're just getting started melissa just telling you so and you guys have more projects on the go is it concerning sasquatch and bigfoot like this is there's more to <laughs> convey yes yes so definitely <laughs> what what is the essential po um point or objective of the flash of beauty film um the overall okay, i mean go ahead sorry okay sure. well i was gonna say the over i mean the overall objective is to really kind of inform folks out there you know what what we think these things might be that they're not all dangerous some are very dangerous some are very docile um they're all they all have different personalities they all kind of look different um they have special abilities um you know and i know tobe can fill in a couple of things i'm forgetting but but yeah it's kind of like we're like the pr group for bigfoot you know <laughs> Yeah, it's, you know, it's a film for the witness. It's a, it's kind of a sentimental uh, objective for the people that have been marginalized by relating this incredible idea that these things exist, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also a way to prepare the world for the eventuality of this subject matter being taken seriously. And that's what we're seeing right now with incredible things that used to be laughed at. And so we're in this this real interesting area of flux, right? And so these liminal times are usually when the paranormal veils thin. This is what esoteric beliefs say. If you're in these liminal spaces, strange things will happen and synchronicities will happen. Well, we're smack dab in this liminal space. And so Bigfoot is a part of this issue here. And, um, you know, Brett and Jill and Mike Ferry, the cinematographer, the you know, beautiful camera shots you see were set up in, in large part due to him. And, um, you know, we unabashedly are leaning into where the rabbit hole is taking us. And it just, you know, it just keeps getting so deep um, that it's fascinating. And it gets so fascinating that you don't care what people think. And that's right. the part that really gets you excited. Just like, oh, I used to care like what these guys would say about me after I left the room because it would just be crazy, right? But now we're so backed up by the DOD, by the Pentagon, by these whistleblowers that are saying these incredible things that um, these ultra terrestrial beings here that live possibly between two worlds is exactly what the First Nations people have told us all along about what Sasquatch is. And I think so, there's over 600 different names for Bigfoot uh, wow. throughout the tribal history. And so they all pretty much take it seriously. So you're not coming at this from a predominantly physical, I'm looking for a creature, I'm looking for droppings or carcasses sort of perspective. You're coming at it from a different perspective. Do you want to elaborate on that? For people who are, there's people, and I hear them all the time, they're like, well, there's no proof. You'd yeah. find a carcass, you'd find some droppings. There, there's zero proof that that even exists, so it doesn't exist. But you this guys are a, at a new a, spin. Yeah, this uh, the idea that you're going to go out and find evidence about something that is largely uh, spiritual in nature or supernatural in nature is not how this works. This is... Um, this is something that you experience and don't prove. Proof comes with it, and you're lucky if you get away with it. Like, you know, 
a jar of peanut butter recently was all over Facebook based upon evidence, right? Like, so what, what happened with this jar of peanut butter? Well, some people care a lot about, you know, that kind of evidence. Did Bigfoot get in the peanut butter jar? Well, this stuff changes you far beyond physical evidence of things that you can buy at Walmart. This is about what happens, um, what happens to your life and your religion, what happens to your work, what happens to your relationships when you have one of these hidden events happen, just like Roy Neary, Brett and I always talk about close encounters of the third kind. What happens to an individual like Richard Dreyfus's character when he won't let go of that hidden event and he has to know? That's what this film is. So it's like a big, giant, deep dive. It's yes, a big dive. It's a big, and, deep dive. And and I just want to clarify too that that you know we're saying that that Bigfoot has paranormal abilities, and yeah, he he or they can transition potentially between different dimensions. You know, and, and we've talked to many eyewitnesses that have seen that. Um, we've got video in our sequel that I. You know, I'm willing to bet anything on that is authentic of a cloaked Bigfoot that more or less appears invisible um, to a certain extent. And, you know, there there is a physical attribute to this thing. I mean, there is a flesh and blood attribute. They're not ghosts, per se. Um, they they do. They're biological with paranormal abilities, just to clarify that. OK. So there, there is a, there's a physical element to it, but there's also mm -hmm. a supernatural component where if, if, so if they're not here physically, do you, do you have an understanding of where they're going or how they're doing this, this sort of interdimensional thing? That's a great question. We just know that they're doing it. <laughs> I mean, there's, yeah, there's stories I mean, that's from, mystery, I guess. Yeah. yeah there, there's stories from witnesses that say that they, they know these things. They've been told these things by individuals. These are what we call, you know, like habituators or contactees of Sasquatch. They they have them come to their property or to their hotspot area, and they're given messages or lessons. Um, these, again, are things that the First Nations people had said, you know, since the get. And one of the things that the First Nations people have said that collaborates again with this nagging data point is that Sasquatch comes from the stars or that they are a part of um, the connection to what's going on in the stars or in the sky. Um, so, you know, you can take a deeper dive looking into that possibility, but um, for the most part, they seem to be in full control of when they come here and how they leave here. It's uh, it's not something that you can really measure or quantify or prove. Interesting. Oh, oh, wow. John aside, he normally joins in, but he usually we do it a little later. He said, uh, John aside says, hi, everybody. Thank you for stopping by, John aside, for your quick hi. So I want to understand what are the common myths and misconceptions that people have, you think, about people who are having these experiences? And sightings, like I, I, I'm under the understanding that a lot of people are really reluctant to share because of all the misconceptions that are happening about Bigfoot or Sasquatch or Yeti or whatever, wherever you live in the world. What, what are the co the common ones that you have discovered about this phenomenon that when you're talking to people? You want that one, Brett? <laughs> I'm going to toss, I'm gonna toss like the, pop the sort of myths you, man. or misconceptions. Like, well, like I just listed that they're looking for, you know, fecal matter or something like that. Yeah. That could be a misconception. Or that they, I don't know, do the, you know, do these people even question their own sanity or, oh, you know, yeah. they're kind of ostracized? We can start there, Tobe. <laughs> the sanity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it really does, because this can get inside your head to a degree, but I don't just mean that as a figure of speech, because one of the things people talk about is like, uh, you know, the CIA apparently has voice to skull technology where they can transmit messages into people's heads and kind of drive them crazy. This is what people have said for years now, right? But there's also people in the Bigfoot world that swear that they get messages at all time of day through what they call mind speak. 
from these critters. <laughs> and we don't know who's doing it. They say it's Bigfoot, right? Um, and these are some relatively sane people that I think mean well in the beginning, but as this you know, trickster element of the phenomena goes, you don't quite know what you're looking into and who's giving you what. Um, and that gets into the idea that there's so much overlap with what we're dealing with right now that at one minute, we'll, Brett and I will be talking about Bigfoot and then we trail off, you know, out to Skinwalker Ranch. We trail off into these weird areas where it's just like, how the hell did these guys get here? You think it was a different podcast, but it's and that's the way it is. And unfortunately, a lot of these apers in the community that look at Gigantopithecus, right, as their pr uh, primary model, they will not talk about this stranger stuff um, publicly. They'll talk about it privately. And uh, that's a shame. So we just want to be able to make the idea of this not only palatable, but cool. Like this can be really cool to talk about. And right now it's still kind of not cool to talk about the strange Bigfoot phenomena. We're still the outcast and not the mainstream. But with mm -hmm. Brett and Jill and Mike, this is <laughs> this is going to be cool really quick. Everybody's going to be talking about the strange stuff. I had a similar when I was interviewing someone about fairies and fairy lore from the UK. I she was really nervous. She is a scholar. She did it this in folklore terms, and I said, "You know what? You make the questions up. You tell me what I can ask you, whatever." And I did that, and she was still mad, and she wanted me to edit it all. And oh, I, I, she decided she was uncomfortable with this, so I just scrapped the whole episode because it would have ruined the whole uh, thing. And I just was like, "You know what? I, obviously, you're not comfortable with this yet. I'm just not even putting it up." I'm like, because it just saves us a lot of angst. So there's like yeah. people who have these experiences, even if it's outside of Bigfoot, they are, you know, they just don't want to be judged and picked on and ostracized and called crazy. Yeah. But yet they've, they've experienced something. Yeah. Yeah. This is what we're, this is what part of our mission is with the film is to get people comfortable in yeah. talking about this because um, we get into the psychology of it. And the psychology of it, and you know, what's really interesting to me in doing some you know, limited amount of brain research is that post-traumatic stress disorder will physically leave a mark on your brain. So people say, well, there's no evidence. Well, you know, if you were to take some of these people into uh, a medical facility and do an MRI or whatnot, you would see a physical what looks like a bruise on the brain from that mm -hmm. traumatic experience. I don't know how it works. I don't know why it works, but it it's there. And um, that's medical science. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's hard to argue with that. So the truth is, is that these people, you know, like Tobe used Roy Neary earlier. Roy Neary had a, in the close encounters of the third kind, they don't call it out, but he had a post-traumatic stress disorder experience. He was sitting in his truck waiting at a... a um, uh, railroad crossing when all of a sudden his truck gets like picked up and everything starts flow it's the coolest scene in the movie everything starts floating up and he ends up with the sunburn thing and from that point forward he's freaked out and he's got to see what again and this is the exact same phenomenon that happens with folks that that have had a bigfoot sighting that hasn't been a threatening bigfoot sighting Mm -hmm. um, and not all of them. I don't want to. I don't want to like cast this wide net that everybody has the same experience because they absolutely, positively do not. There's some. Mm -hmm. There's some people, hunters especially, who are out hunting and they. It's the last thing they expect to see, and they have a bigfoot encounter, and they're done. They don't want to go back hunting again. You know, it just mm -hmm. literally scares them to death. There's some people that um, are immobilized by this. You know what I mean? There's other people that. Um, that see it and it just sparks this wonder. And, you know, Todd Neese is a great example. He had a 25 second sighting of three of them. And that from that day forward in 1993, his life hasn't been the same. He's mm -hmm. pursued them for the last 31 years. I mean, that's phenomenal, mm -hmm. you know, and, and Todd Neese is by no stretch alone in this country. Right. So we got a comment um, from Incognito. My husband's watching. Again, he's my biggest fan, I think. <laughs> he says, I, I agree that Bigfoot is a metaphysical creature, one among many. Oh, you chose well, so, Melissa. 
And to boot on what Brett was saying, that, you know, a Bigfoot sighting, um, it must leave uh, a mark in your brain, on your brain, a hematoma, um, a bruise, because it rewires your priorities to a degree that is like a, it's like a religious experience, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's something else other than seeing something remarkable. It's, it's transformative. Like, you know, they talk about, um, oh, is it Diana Pasuka, who's a religious scholar uh, studying UFOs? And she talks about how the saints had possibly radiation marks on their hand instead of stigmatas. This is what we're talking wow. about here is that we're misunderstanding this addiction here. If we were going back 300 years to see what some of these people have seen, they would have been sainted mm -hmm. because they're seeing magnificent stars and lights and angelic figures that, you know, we call UFOs. Right. But then there's this other side to it that I want to elaborate on just to touch base with something relevant. In the last four hours, I've been contacted by somebody in our film that is um, uncomfortable talking about Sasquatch anymore due to the ridicule that they have received over their sighting. Mm. And um, they won't talk about it again. It's, mm. uh, yeah. it's kind of ruined them uh, to a degree. To the, They have regrets over uh, having this event happen to them. They wish they didn't see it. They wish they didn't have to relive it. And right. um, that what else is that but a form of PTSD? That's exactly what that is. Yeah. It's a curse. It's yeah. like, it can I, be. A I was going to ask you about curses or, well, look at that. My camera's going out of focus. I'm like, ooh, metaphysical. Woo. Yeah, you're yeah. kind of like it's Bigfoot. Spooky. Bigfoot's always. Right. Right. I was <laughs> teleport. I was yeah, trying to teleport. Moment, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was, it didn't work out, though. I was going to ask about curses. Like, is there anything associated? Like, I'm sure there's legends and myth where these are seen as curses. Sure, like there's certain Native American tribes. I I don't want to say which ones, but it might be the Northern Cali tribe, Calipuya tribe, the Upa, in and around Northern California. They have a prophecy that if you see a Sasquatch, um, it's a bad omen to the degree that, that it's an end times event. Like to see Sasquatch has negative connotations up in the north. They're cannibals, so obviously to see a Sasquatch means that um, your time is short. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, and this is just here in North America. This is a global event. We haven't even talked about, you know, the, um, Orang Pendek or the, the Yeti. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, there's many different little names, right. For these hairy people that have been, uh, seemingly kind of chosen or shunned to the outer perimeters of society. Yet they seem to have a culture, right? Like they have a language. So if they have a language, there are no languages that exist without culture. And if they do have culture, that means they have religion because there are no cultures that don't have a deity. And so that's, right. that's the breakthrough is that they seem to have a language. And the implications of what are called morphine streams or um, you know cognitive sentences that add together meaning with a family group, uh, it's, it's just such a cool concept and it just happens to be seemingly real yeah and <coughs> what's what's interesting about bigfoot is i find uh, like a lot of the critics sort of kind of deduce it down to like a mental illness do you think there's a possibility that people do project something out and that's what they see back like the, do you think there's a possibility that the mind is doing something or do you think that's not the case because i know Tobe, you've done tons of experiences and had experiences yourself so i don't want to i'm not implying but there might be some people who i mean their mind they're not crazy but their mind is really powerful yeah yeah that's a great I'm, yeah. I'll, I'll throw that out there uh, I'm, that's a great question melissa and yeah i mean is there a possibility? Absolutely, there's a possibility. But does that account for all of the sightings? No, not at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the fact of the matter is, is that it's really, truly mathematically impossible that you would have the tens of thousands of sightings and experiences that all correlate. You know, people, people from anywhere from California to Maine 
from Florida to Washington State, people that have had these experiences, it's mathematically impossible that they're all something other than Bigfoot. Um, right. Unless this is a, you know, a massive psyop operation that's being conducted by the government somehow, I mean, which would need to be, and I used to work for the government, that would need to be uh, really, really extensive and um, very expensive and for what purpose? You know, and how would that explain some of the physical evidence that people have found? You know, yeah. so, yeah, I mean, minds do play tricks on people. Minds are, you know, the human brain is the most complex thing that we're, that science knows of in the universe uh, yeah. for now. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and we don't know much about it, but we do know that it is capable. The human mind's capable of things that we don't know yet. And um, and that includes some supernatural things that we're not really ready to, you know, accept. No. And it doesn't make it any less interesting if that's the case, right? Because of that. I think it's fascinating. Right. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Like this is called a tulpa, right? Like a thought form. Yeah. We've created right. this physical egregore of sorts here, which, you know, if it becomes real based upon observation, does that have anything to do with that um, double slit experiment where observation changes the pattern of right. what is what is happening right spooky yeah. action at a distance uh now we're in the simian hind territory so if you if you really want to go down the rabbit hole invite uh dr simian hind who wrote a book dark matter monsters who's kind of the anchor he is the anchor in the documentary that helps all of us kind of citizen scientists wrap our minds around the cutting edge science of of what could be happening here as far as the more supernatural aspects of mm -hmm. sighting so we have a comment it's um incognito he says the sierra sounds seem to prove they have a language I, i've never heard of that what is do you guys know what the sierra sounds is we have no idea <laughs> no, I'm, 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 um, so, so so much so melissa that is our next documentary we've oh, already started, started filming it um it's uh, voices in the wilderness was a book that ron moorhead wrote and um <clears throat> most people most of your audience will know that what the Sierra sounds are, obviously, but basically, what you know, just so you understand, is it was uh, you know these these hunters, these these men from Central California, from a valley in Central California, that had found a really cool, really great deer hunting location about eighty five hundred feet in the wilderness, and it was it's top secret. You know, they didn't want anybody to know about it, so they go up there and they built these kind of shelters and they would hang out, <clears throat> and in the middle of the night, they'd hear these these voices, these grunts and, and, you know, just the, the strange talking, the strange language. Um, they didn't coin the term samurai chatter, but um, another Bigfoot researcher coined that term, but that's kind of what it sounds like. It's kind of like all over the place, highs and lows. Um, and it sounds intelligent. It sounds goofy when you first hear it, but when you start listening to it, it sounds very intelligent. And Ron Moore had recorded all of these sounds um, and he, um, he got a call from a guy by the name of Scott Nelson, who happened to be a naval crypto linguist who discovered the sounds, I believe in 2012, was it Tobe maybe? And, um, just kind of happened on them on accident. And Scott Nelson speaks, you know, four or five different languages fluently. Um, and he quickly realized that it was, that's exactly what it was, was a language. And um, he breaks it down in our documentary, A Flashy Beauty Bigfoot Revealed. He talks about why it's a language and, and why it would be impossible to fake. Now, I know when I had you on my po older podcast, um, Toby, you were showing me some sound clips of noises and scratches and talking about gifting and things appearing. What was, did you guys experience that or find that out when you were doing this documentary where there's other people that had similar experience, like things just appearing and reporting and different weird sounds and recordings? Well, so due to the overlap issue of what Bigfoot causes, um, ghost activity and UFO activity, there's an uptick. And so uh, is it related to the phenomena? Yeah, I don't know if Bigfoot's responsible for all of it, but, um, you know, we just talked about Ron Moorhead. They experienced this as well. Ron 
you know, he started off in the world of flesh and blood just based upon the fact that he wanted some credible science just behind the fact that there seemed to be an undocumented language associated with the shadowy phenomena they saw in the High Sierras. But um, also there were strange lights, strange sounds that followed him home, objects that sound like they were being destroyed, but when they'd go outside of their camp, there would be nothing wrong. Um, shape-shifting perhaps down at the base of the camp, mimicking um, people being, horses being put to sleep, laying upside down between the trees. These are all things that are expressed by someone that this community completely respects, right? Because generally when you tell those kind of stories, you're, you're set apart. Ron is not. Um, and it's for the fact that he has a, a really good attitude about accepting how crazy this sounds, but now putting it in the world of Nikolai Tesla and quantum physics and understanding that the DOD has been interested in this. They've had side projects looking into this phenomenon, probably Sasquatch specifically, because they sure don't have any questions for us. I mean, you know, Rich Germain, our documentary, makes that point really well, is that they don't have any questions for Brett or I. They know what they've got. And, you know, Brett, um, Rich calls them undocumented aliens, which is a kind of a cute term for what we're dealing with here because, <laughs> you know, they are seemingly kind of alien, right? There is this alien aspect to what we have going on here. And if they were green and had antenna, they do the same things that a regular alien kind of does. Yeah, that's 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 interesting because... I was like, I admit when you first came on my show and you were <clears throat> doing the sounds, I was like really skeptical because I'd never really researched. I was like, well, anyone can make those sounds. I'm like, and then I was like, well, why would, why would he like, why would anyone fake that? And then I've heard, I had people take me in forests of British Columbia and hunters who were telling me stuff. And I was like, oh, well, maybe there's something to this. Uh -huh. But I think, I, I think I just, I'm skeptical on general because, you know, I, I just am because I've been. I'm just down. <laughs> it's just in my nature. I'm always like, oh, yeah. Um, but um, oh, someone's messaging me saying they missed this last watch thing. No, we're still on. We're still here. Yeah. <laughs> I have a feeling. I have a feeling that my Facebook isn't connecting up properly because nobody's showing up on Facebook and they usually do. Oh. So I don't okay. think it's connected properly to Facebook. Okay. That's a rarity. Anyways. Um, <clears throat> Well, we got we got another comment from Incognito. He says, "Definitely sounds like Japanese. It's pretty amazing. Can't wait to see your next film." Cool. We're gonna have to watch the first one. Mm -hmm. Um, we're gonna have to watch the first one. So I wanted to say, um, what is the most fascinating film footage that you've ever seen that you find convincing on Bigfoot or Sasquatch? Go for mm. it, Brian. Um. No question in my mind, it's it's the Barb Shoop footage that we feature in A Flash of Beauty Paranormal Bigfoot. And um, I, you know, and I going back to your, your healthy being skeptical thing or that the fact mm -hmm. that you're skeptical, that's, that's healthy. That's the way mm -hmm. science should be, you know what I mean? Because what's the point if you're not skeptical, right? And, you know, I came across this footage when I first saw it, I didn't really see what the fuss was about because I didn't really see the anomaly. I didn't see the cloaking. I'm like, oh, well, this is weird. Um, and then I went back and looked at it and I actually, I needed to, to have the original file. You know, I needed to be like, I needed to know that somebody didn't manipulate the file. And and the way I can do that mm -hmm. is like, look at the, the metadata of the file right. and confirm some things. And I fully 100% trusted Barb Shoe, but you know, she's, she's very well respected in the big footing world. Um, but you know, there's, there's things that we all need to confirm for ourselves. And so I got the file from her and I, I looked at it and looked at it and looked at it for over three hours, looking for anything and everything that could explain what it was that I was seeing, because, you know, it's a, it's a lot to put something like that into our film because I don't, mm -hmm. I don't want to open ourselves up to ridicule. I don't want to open Barb up to ridicule. That's virtually unavoidable in this genre. Um, and I can't find anything. I can't find anything that disproves that what is in this footage isn't actuality, wasn't photographed. 
And what's super interesting about it is that what Barb saw with her own naked eyes and what the camera caught are two different things. She saw she saw a black figure. And this has mm-hmm. cap- captured something that looks like the Predator. It's the best way to describe it if, if you've seen the movie The Predator mm-hmm. or some, somebody else has seen it. That's exactly what it looks like. And I believe that it's some of the most important footage that at least that I've ever seen. But I mean, as far as this realm is concerned of the paranormal, I think it's some of the most important footage. I think, ever. I, I think some people call that like the glimmer man. I've heard mm-hmm. people call it like glimmer man or something where, and they've told me it looks like predator film. Yeah. And I thought maybe they were like hallucinating or something, but it's interesting if somebody, if the footage picked up one thing, but somebody saw like a shadowy creature, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah, and it, it keeps coming back. Um, this idea that they're cloaking themselves, I keep hearing, you know, there was this thing in Miami with these aliens, and I don't know where I stand on that. I keep hearing, you know, completely different remarks. But one thing I have heard from people, from eyewitnesses, is that they saw them glitching. They saw them get kind of blurry or fuzzy, these, these eight, nine-foot tall aliens, which is kind of coincidental, isn't it, that they're eight or nine feet tall? Um, and then there was another alien sighting by some, uh, a family, a Hispanic family in Las Vegas, um, who said the exact same thing. They said, he's blurry. They're blurry, you know? So I think that's, a, that's what they're doing in real life. I think Toby's um, abducted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See you later. Yeah. Um, no, I'm sure he'll be back. I think something was just ringing in the background there. I was going to say, it, does the military have any kind of technology that you know of where they can do this? I know China has some stuff where they can have, they actually can have some kind of cloaking device. And is, is there any technology you know that I'm just put, putting this out there? I'm not calling everybody hallucinating and there's nothing there, but is there some kind of technology? that you know of where people could appear as sort of like a glimmer man or yes. like yeah 100 you know? and people can google it people can google cloaking technology but here's the difference is that the naked eye and the camera see the exact same thing mm-hmm. um and it's it's you know it's okay it looks okay it's not you know i mean if if you or anybody else was to go out into the woods with that technology you know you would blend right in especially if you were still and and the thing is, is that this observer that's off in the background that Barb Shoup captured with her camera, mm-hmm. it's just, it's doing just that. And it knows that if it moves, then it's going to be seen, right? So, so right. these creatures, these Bigfoot have this uncanny ability to be as like still as statues. And that's how they're avoided because, you know, you go out into the woods and how many black mob or masses are there and black blobs and whatnot, you know, dark blobs. So they blend in really easily. But the second they move, you know, we pick up on that. And this particular being, uh, you know, it, you can clearly see it duck down, turn and run away um, mm-hmm. like a little kid, you know, and, and the thing wasn't all that big. So we're theorizing that it was probably a juvenile that just wasn't, a uh, pro Bigfoot yet, you know, like it, like thought that people were right. looking at it and thought that, you know, it was mm-hmm. a good time for it to bolt and it needs some more practice. Needs some more practice because it was caught. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's really interesting. Cause like, I, like you never know, you never know what, I don't want to say any, uh, any three letter organizations are up to these days. You just never know. I wouldn't it, like sigh up. I, I just, Nothing. I wouldn't put anything behind them. No comment. All right. So, comment. have have you had <laughs> any Bigfoot experiences? Like the most um, fascinating Bigfoot experience that you've you've actually ever personally had? Yes, I've had. I mean, I haven't had a full daylight sighting by any stretch, um, but I have seen eye glow along with Jill and Michael Ferry, our our mm-hmm. cinematographer. We've seen their eye glow. Do I know a hundred percent that it was Bigfoot? No. Um, but, you know, through some deductive reasoning, looking at them, I can rule out most anything else. Um, you know, and, and, and I tell this to people. I say we, we have kind of an advantage in that we're filmmakers and, um, you know, we, we quote unquote paint with light. And so we're very familiar with different types of lights, um, different temperatures of light, so on and so forth. And what we saw were, you know, glowing eyes. I, I ended up getting a picture of one. I feature it. and. Um, 
flashy beauty paranormal Bigfoot. And you, I only got a single eye, but you can actually see that eye. It's almond shaped. And you can see it close. Um, and in the pitch darkness. In the pitch darkness, you know, you, I kind of go through it frame by frame, and you can see it. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know if it was a profile that I picked up. It was looking the other direction, or if there was a branch that was covering the other eye. I don't know what happened, but. Um, it's pretty convincing evidence that what we were looking at were eyes. Um, so we've seen that and then we've been bluff charged. Um, that was the, the, the next night. Um, and that was, you know, and it's, again, it's like when you don't see something, you try and rationalize it. And, you know, the first thought in my mind was, oh, that was a deer or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then you go back and you kind of rewind the experience in your head and you're like, no, that was bipedal and it was too heavy. You know, you didn't hear a gallop. You heard a stomping. Right. Kind of thing. You know, we've also heard wood knocks. Um, I've I've gotten a, a response um, that was loud and proud, if you will. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. You know, that like literally made the hair stand up in the back of my head. So there's been and, and we caught a growl on camera that's in the movie and stuff like that. So there's been some some interesting things. I used to go for a hike in a wooded area on Vancouver Island when I lived there. And there was two sides. There was on one side of the highway, you would hike down to the ocean. Mm -hmm. And then there was on the other side of the highway, it went into swampland. And I would hike on the other side. And as I was hiking in, I would get this like overwhelming, really awful feeling that I was being watched. And I thought maybe it was a cougar. So I hiked it out of there. Like, and I, you know, it just disturbed me. And I tried going back again to that side. And every time I went back I and I would get deeper in, it was like, like, it was just so bizarre. It was such a bizarre feeling. I just couldn't, I, I just literally would start shaking. Like I just couldn't stand it. Now I don't know what was in there. I would just go over to the other side by the ocean. Cause I didn't feel that way there. And it was, and I recently had a friend who lives on Vancouver Island, whose family used to own all that land. And she started talking about that area out of nowhere, telling me how there was definitely something there that she thought there was some kind of creature or something. And she started saying these, I hadn't mentioned a word about this. So she started saying that side, there's some kind of portal, there's something there, there's some kind of weird energy and I can't go on that side. And I was like, oh, wow. Have you guys had any experiences like that? Like, Tobe, you can go ahead and talk about any strange experiences you've had. But I've had that hiking in the woods on Vancouver Island where I, it was just too overwhelming. And I was like, well, I don't want to get eaten by a cougar. <laughs> and then I have somebody else tell me, no, no, it's not a cougar. It's a portal. And there might be Sasquatch or anything there. Yeah. Oh, Tobe just. Oh. Oh. oh, there he is. There he is. Oh, someone's ringing through. <laughs> <laughs> Tope, Tope's like disappears more than big feet do. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing everything I can here for whatever reason. It keeps freezing up on my computer, so I logged on my phone. But to get to your point real quick, are there areas that I dare not go into? Um, sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, froze up again. Now he's mind speaking to us. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Shoot. Well, I mean, and that's really real. Like I've heard that multiple times people in the forest, they just, and it could be a wild animal, but I don't think it was. And I had her confirm that. And she's like, no, there's something by those swamplands. And I was like, well, that makes sense. I'm glad I'm yeah. glad I, I took a hint and got out of there. I mean, you know, the, I, I think that, that what was happening to you is, is, completely legit we hear it from people all the time you know it feels like they can project a certain type of energy that makes you feel unwanted makes you feel like you want to leave um you know and i think sometimes humans sell themselves short you know we've got to remember that we mm -hmm. are you know animals biologically speaking you know we're primates mm -hmm. and um you know yeah we have modern life and phones and stuff like that and i think which which detaches us even more from our our primordial instincts but they're there. There's a, there's a part of our brain that that's there that we don't utilize all the time. It's like having airbags in a car. You know, you hope you never have to use them or any of the other safety equipment in your car. It's like all you want to do is go point A to point B and live your life, you know, like a vehicle. But there are occasions where there's certain things, whether it's a certain frequency that's being projected at you or there's a infrasound, which many, many people talk about. 
Uh, it's like this feeling of dread. It's feeling, you know, and they know what it is because they leave the premises and it goes away and they feel normal. So they know it wasn't like a bad tuna sandwich or something. You know what I mean? It's or yeah. or whatever. Lack of caffeine. Um, they, they these things don't want to be seen unless they are the ones that are in control. We've talked to many people who believe that they uh, would not have had their sighting if they had a camera with them, you know, for instance. Uh, they believe that they are specifically picking people out to show themselves to. And if they don't want to show themselves to you, or maybe if they, even if they have like babies or whatever, they want you gone. You know, they don't want yeah. you walking around in their living room. Yeah. It's true. Uh, and I'll tell you for, for one thing, for that experience, I know it wasn't just me. I knew it wasn't just me because as soon as I left that area, it was gone. Like I was like, Oh, I feel way better. Yeah. And on, when I was on the other side, going down to the ocean, I felt like normal again. Yeah. So I was like, obviously something is about that area. And mm -hmm. I just stopped going over there. Yeah. And um, yeah, it just creeps you out. Well, we're coming up. I know you have to get going. So what I want to tie it up is um, I would love if you come back when you get the second film out. It would be of awesome. Course. It's but out. The second film's out. Yeah. So it's out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I didn't know. I thought you guys were working on it. Oh, well, that's the third. That. That's the third film. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. So yeah. the third film, where yeah. can, where can we find you? Where can they find your films and your movies? Can they get them on Amazon? Where can you push that for people who are interested in this phenomenon? Yeah. So Amazon is the best place to find um, both of our movies. The first one in the sequel, a flash of beauty. If you just type in a flash of beauty on Amazon, both movies will come up. Uh, we also have a really, um, really cool YouTube page where we're posting the full length interviews from our first film. Um, and many people uh, love watching everything, you know what I mean? Instead of an edited down interview, they like watching the entire thing because they can get context and stuff like that. So Amazon, YouTube, and then um, Facebook, we try and update our Facebook page on a pretty regular basis. Um, so come like our page, get notified. You know, when we've got something else going on and we will occasionally do live streams on our YouTube page as well. Right. So if they type in a flash of beauty, Bigfoot revealed, they'll get you. Yep. hundred percent. Yep. Awesome. They'll come up with the movies and you can rent them right there on Amazon. All right. Well, I want to thank you for coming in. I know you have to get going, so I'll let you off and I'll tie up the show. And unfortunately, Tobe is having some technical difficulties, but he's, we'll get him back at another he's time. He's flying around at a UFO right now. I swear he's been. A yeah, bit, yeah. <laughs> Bigfoot's there going, uh, 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 uh. He's yeah. not talking anymore. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on and we'll see you again. Take care. Thank you, Melissa. Take care. Really appreciate right. it. No Bye -bye. problem. All right. Well, that was our show for tonight. Unfortunately, Tobe. I don't know. Was it Bigfoot? Does Tope live out in the wilderness and things are a little glitchy? I don't know. I think um, we'll never find out. We will never know. But I want to thank you guys. This was a shorter episode today because Brett had he's a very busy man. He has tons of projects and tons of stuff going on for Bigfoot. But remember, if you guys Google search or search on YouTube or Facebook, uh, Flash of Beauty, Bigfoot Revealed, you will find their documentary. And they are working on a part three so i'm going to head out and i hope you guys have a wonderful week we are back next week i think walter bosley is on next week next tuesday at um 8 p.m eastern and we're talking about tataria so we'll see you next tuesday 8 p.m eastern take care everybody good night <laughs>